so uh that being said it's noon eastern here and um um we probably should invite the people in shouldn't we yep all right, All right. So let's do that. It looks like we got uh, it looks like we got a bunch of people. So I'm gonna um. Oh wow! Well. <laughs> yeah, that's always good. So let's do this. I was afraid I would have to talk only to Bob Perry and reminiscent of 50 years ago. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well. It's been snowballing each time we do it. You know, it's snowballing. Yeah. Well, we had uh, the few left, literally. I mean, definitely active. I mean, I'm very active, actually. Uh, thank God. And I know that you are too. But uh, very, very few of us of the old guard, you know, either they passed away or they are no longer in the business or bankrupt or <laughs> uh, chasing other dreams. I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's, that's a problem. I mean... Uh, Mm -hmm. I can't interview Gary Mull. That's right. You know, and can't yeah. interview Laurie Davidson. And Britain Chance. Britain Pauline Chance. Stephens, you know. Oh, imagine what Britain Doug Peterson. Chance, imagine what Britain Chance would be like on here. Oh, I know. Oh, he, he, he was helping me a lot uh, in my early days when I was involved with 12 meters and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that's another chapter <laughs> okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna do my formal introduction here okay i think that's time joe so um, we are we are online now yeah mm -hmm. we have um 17 people on and uh oh okay you know, it's uh you know we hand over show over to you guys okay well uh in 1973 mm -hmm. i answered a an ad in yachting magazine for a draftsman for dick carter and yeah. Dick invited me back there for a two-week trial period, and I passed mm -hmm. the trial and yeah. moved back there and <clears throat> showed up for work on Monday morning at the tower and was introduced to this uh, young French guy, Yves-Marie Tanton, and uh, he was going to be my boss <laughs> at the tower. And I, we worked on the third floor, I think, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Third floor. And uh, Dick Carter had the fourth floor, and Chuck Payne and Mark Lindsay had the fifth floor. And the floors were, those upper floors were connected by ladders. And every once in a while, one of us would take the fast way down. <laughs> <laughs> I remember oh, yeah. Dick coming down, still holding his coffee cup up as he flew down the, <laughs> down the ladder. Oh, no, it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, my my idea going to the tower was now I'm going to learn all the secrets. I'm going to learn the secrets. So after a couple of weeks working side by side with Eve Marie, and I do mean side by side, the inside dimension of <laughs> our floor was 12 feet by 12 feet, and that didn't count the hole in the corner for the ladder. So we literally worked uh, six feet apart. Uh, but we had a beautiful view. And uh, for sure. eat the, 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 the jobs in the tower were spread out. Uh, each guy had sort of his area of specialty. Uh, I don't know what Chuck and Mark did, <laughs> but <laughs> Marie had the posh job of drawing all the hull lines. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm kind of sensitive about this because I see guys that work for other designers and they say, well, I designed this and I designed that boat when I was there. I'm not sure you can do that with any integrity. I don't care if you did every drawing for the design. If you didn't draw the hull lines, you can't say I designed that boat. But if the only drawing you did was the hull lines, you can say I designed that boat. And, um, so when you see a magazine article that said from the drawing board of Dick Carter, it was really from the drawing board of Eve Marie Tanton. But uh, we didn't bring that up in the tower. <laughs> we just did our job. So I was, I was sort of Eve Marie's gopher. 
and he drew hull lines all day and I drew interiors and construction drawings and sail plans and deck plans. I didn't get to draw hull lines, except one time I got really close when Eve Marie asked me to just draw the grid for a set of lines. Don't draw the lines, just draw the grid. So I drew the grid, gave it to Eve Marie right after lunch. And about three o'clock in the afternoon, he said, Bub, he called me Bub. Bub, <laughs> this is terrible. I cannot work with this grid. It is too inaccurate. <laughs> so I got a, a chewing out and a lesson in how to draw a really accurate grid. Eve Marie is the consummate master of lines drawing, which today doesn't mean much because computers, but back in the day when we were doing it at the tower, that was a skill that, I don't know that you could teach that skill really. You either had that ability to see shapes in your head and realize how they went together or you didn't, but Eve Marie produced incredibly accurate sets of lines for boats. They're just works of art. And I, everything I know about drawing lines by hand, I pretty much learned by working with Eve Marie. Eve Marie also did the IOR analysis for the hulls because he had to, had to do that during the design process. So we were all getting along just fine, and we're all buddies. It was a, it was a good blend of people. And Eve Marie was the first of that group of four of us to leave and start his own office. And that was that was a little hard um, for me. I mean, given the influence he had, um, but he went off on his own. And uh, I went to visit him one night and he was, he was drawing a quarter tonner. And this is about the time I was starting the Islander 28. And I looked at his hull lines for this quarter tonner. And I thought, well, damn, that, that's a cool shape. It wasn't a really IOR shape. It, it was more like a salad bowl, widely flared midsection. So I, I kept that image in my head and I, I used that basic shape for the Islander 28 hull. So thank you, Eve Marie. <laughs> Your royalties will be in the mail. <laughs> uh, so Eve Marie probably should have gone on to dominate the world of race boat design, but, but uh, destiny and fortune have their own ways. And, uh, since Eve Marie went on his own, he's done everything from race boats to hard shine steel boats for home builders. There's almost not a kind of boat, including power boats, that, that he hasn't uh, hasn't produced. So I think that's enough. We'll, we'll just open it up to Eve Marie now. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, <laughs> Bob. Uh, very much appreciated. A side story, when uh, Dick uh, and I basically, we received in the mail in 73, uh, a large envelope, brown envelope. And we opened it from this guy, Bob Perry from Seattle. And the first thing that I remember was a very large profile picture of his head, you know, like, like uh, almost an advertisement. And then followed by a bunch of plans, blueprints, and where he said on the annotation, oh, I designed this boat in six hours. You know, it was, if I recall, a small cat boat of sorts. And Dick and I, we look at each other and we said, either this guy is full of <laughs> or is really good. So we had him to come uh, over and I uh, got hired on the spot. And uh, that was something I will always remember. And uh, working with them side by side was uh, interesting indeed. Uh, you could ask uh, Bob anything to do. He would do it. Please, please, I want to know, I want to know, and et cetera, et cetera. So very, very great contributor to uh, a unique era in the 
in, in the yacht design business, I mean, really, in so yeah. many ways. And uh, starting with Dick Carter, of course, who's uh, the figure, you know. And uh, so that's <laughs> essentially the, my story. Another story as far as the ladder is concerned, you know, we could be running up and down, running up and down. And Olive, the secretary, was at the bottom, you know, at the bottom. She had a desk there. And one time she turned around and she said to me, Eve Marie, stop running. You know, what's wrong with you? You are young, you are attractive, <laughs> and you are not black. And so <laughs> stop running, you know, <laughs> I was more careful. And we were all 25 years old, you know, 24 or something like that. And so we had a lot of energy and uh, that was translated in the design office where basically we had, uh, we had a lot of power. I remember one morning Dick walked in and he said, I can just feel the horsepower in here. Well, that's yeah. a good, yeah, a good way to put it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's what I may remember about Bob, but that Manila envelope was <laughs> what started it all, really. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was I don't a, remember. A big portrait of himself. And uh, that's, you know, the beginning. <laughs> that, was a, that was the photograph that was taken after I just had <clears throat> a dental surgery on oh, one yeah. side. So it's a straight profile. Yeah, the yeah. other side of my face is all yeah. swollen up. <laughs> yeah, you see, I remember because it yeah. was so amazing, and you know, I, and ever since, obviously, uh, Bob has been the, the prince of PR. <laughs> and uh, but we had a good time, and uh, you know, and the tower was uh, something else for sure. And uh, next to the house, um, man, do I remember all that? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Christmas time when we get invited in for our one one invite a year <laughs> for one glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I went there more often than you simply because I was a translator for a lot of things too, you know, with the clients and Raul Gardini. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, high powered uh, potential clients uh, uh, from Europe, especially. But um, yeah. I remember also a side story, but when I first came to the tower, uh, I, uh, I came late. I mean, that's another story altogether. But basically, I was in the tower, and it was a blizzard of a day. I mean, the waves were crashing on the rocks. The, the snow was unbelievable. So I was... Uh, they, Jim Ardvik Anderson at the time was uh, Dick's right hand, an engineer. And uh, basically, I was going to replace him if I ever get the job, uh, because he was going back to Denmark. His wife apparently didn't like much uh, about America. But that's another story as well. So while I'm working on, the, on this drawing that they gave me to do, uh, they went to lunch. And uh, they let me in the tower. And again, wave crashing, blizzard, and everything. And all of a sudden, I saw two little kids in tears coming out of the house and Dick Carter behind them holding a black cat dead. <laughs> 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 I say, I'm never going to get the job. I mean, I have a black cat, kids, you know, torn apart, crying and everything else. And sure enough, he was shoveling the snow to bury the cat <laughs> under a tree. So, Eventually, the same day, I received, uh, I received the, the, the okay, I got the job. And I always remember, uh, by that time, I had zero, zero, zero dollar in my pocket. And that's at the end of the day, when we came down the, the, up the tower, I turn around and I see Dick, Dick, can I borrow $10? <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me strangely. I literally had no zero money. So uh, it was a very, very lucky. And uh, I stayed there four years and uh, uh, just under four. And uh, it's, uh, it was an uh, incredible time. Incredible times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You should tell the story about when you got out there to meet Dick for the first time. Oh, yeah. Good story. Yeah, well, that was the first time. And uh, 
basically, I don't know if I can extend on all that, but basically um, I came from the 12 meters, the French program. I was working for Andre Moric at the time, the, design, the French designer. And after the mandatory uh, military service in France, where I was incorporated uh, into the program of the 12 meters, I was also designing boats and I was in charge of the tank testing at the University of Nantes. So I was a, quite a busy guy. And uh, in 70, late 70, uh, I addressed uh, an application for a job with Sparkman and Stevens in New York. And uh, wow, uh, you know, I got the answer that they would consider it. And at the time, in order to, to get a job in America, you had to have three sponsors. And fortunately, I had Olin Stevens, Roderick Stevens, and Britain Chance to sponsor me. And that was quite uh, remarkable, really, uh, so much so that I received my green card in three months uh, to fly over there. And I actually, uh, it was a little too early that they were not even waiting for me at the time, because, you know, usually it takes a lot longer to get a green card. But I decided to take a chance and uh, fly to New York and meet uh, Olin that I met before in Europe because I was sailing a lot there, uh, but uh, not very well, of course, but well enough, he knew me well enough to hire me, I guess. Um, so I arrive, I show all my plans, the drawing, the 12 meters, lines plan and everything else, my tank testing stuff. And uh, they said, well, we're not going to wait a month. So you can start Monday. And I look at them. And again, it was a blizzard day. I came from Cannes on my blue blazer, you know, uh, nice tan. I mean, <laughs> and I was in the middle of New York. And I said, I don't think I want to work here, which is <laughs> probably unique, unique in the history of the Sparkman and Stephen's uh, saga. So at the end of the interview, uh, they all went home basically, except for uh, Bob Harris, Robert Harris. And he said, what are you going to do now? I have not the faintest idea. By that time from $137 that I had in my pocket, I re arriving in New York, I was down by $17 that I spent on the hotel the night before. And so I was down to just above $100. So uh, Bob Harris asked me, where are you going to go? I have no idea. Uh, so, well, come, come in our family and we'll figure something. So I went there and we had dinner. And after dinner, we called three places. Uh, uh, Bob Director, Palmer Johnson, and eventually uh, making a, um, an appointment with Dick Carter who I was familiar with because I sailed against him in the One Ton Cup 1966 in Denmark. But anyway, um, and so I got a job by, for director, I got a job for Palmer Johnson, and I had a meeting uh, with the Carter for the next day. And uh, so I was really, really looking forward to it because I admire his boats, I admire the simplicity and the, the thoroughness of details and so on. So. I was looking forward and I took the train, $12.50 to Boston. In Boston, I arrived in the middle of the night, again, awful, awful blizzard and snow. And I jump on the bus and vaguely figured out where Nahant was, you know, it's sort of a peninsula. It's not, <laughs> you know, it's not obvious where it is. And uh, therefore uh, we end up on this bus. And I said uh, to the conductor, I said, you have to drop me off to the closest thing that everybody knows in Nahant. I said, oh, there's the Nahant Pharmacy. Oh, okay. And so eventually after a long uh, journey, I arrived at this pharmacy and it was late at night and dark, you know, it was March 2nd, I believe, 1971. And, uh, and uh, I, I went into the pharmacy and I said, can I make a phone call? And the farmer says, no, 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 we don't have a phone here, just outside in that uh, cabin, you know, the other cabin with a phone there. But the cabin with the phone had three foot of snow in front of the door. I spent 15 minutes in the call with no glove, no, no nothing, <laughs> tried to open the goddamn door. Then I had to figure out how the telephone worked. You know, it was different. Finally, I got in touch with Dick Carter over the phone and said, sorry, I'm late for this appointment today. 
but uh, I guess, uh, you know, the snow and so on, it was very difficult. They said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Click. <laughs> he hang up on me. I said, what the hell I'm doing here, you know? So I ran back in the pharmacy and by that time they had a client. He arrived in the yellow Volkswagen, I remember. And I grabbed him literally by the, the lapel of his coat. And I said, you, you got to help me. <laughs> and he dropped me off at the nearest motel where I spent the night. And the next day, uh, I had this meeting uh, with uh, Dick Carter and Jim. And that's when I got the job, uh, the, despite the black cat. <laughs> 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 and that's my story. Well, you remember, you remember I, I tried to walk from... Logan Airport to the yeah, yeah, in the middle of the yeah, night. Yeah. It wasn't for some guys in a bar that took pity on me and drove me out there. But you know, I, we just didn't have any money, right? No, I mean, no I, I told you, money. I mean, I had to borrow ten dollars from Dick Carter. Yeah. <laughs> and fortunately, a friend of mine working at Hood Sailmakers at the time in Marblehead, you know, as a sailmaker. So Mark Bonduel, his name is. So I called him up. Because I knew he was working there, and I spent a weekend there, and the next Monday I started working. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's have some questions. Do we? <laughs> Don't be bashful. Yeah, just go for it, guys. Unmute yourself, ask a question, and uh, continue the um, conversation. Well, I don't. Uh, how, how about? Oh, oh, oh. I'll start if that's okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> I, I have had a great time looking through your blog. I, I, I won't say anything other than you looking through your blog and being able to talk or not talk, but interact with Bob on a regular basis and looking at this, the material he's provided in his book. Your blog is, is like a, is a, is a class in keels and rigs and foils and and everything that sort of lives on the edge and isn't really discussed in a lot of just general um boat talk wow. and, and the, the, the blog you know and i wouldn't have found it if it wasn't for this call being set up and said i'm going to do a little <laughs> bit of homework because i've heard the name and know who you are but the blog yeah. really set things apart and i, I yeah I, the, the blog is great. Everybody should read your blog if they have any interest in, in any kind of, of sailboat or powerboat design. And then yeah. especially when you go back to some of the old boats that are out there and then talk about them, it, 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 it's, it's great. My one question, mm -hmm. until I have another question, <laughs> is yeah, you, have, right. you have a 40-some-odd foot, maybe 35-foot boat that you've, you've drawn in your blog, sailboat. Uh, drop keel, twin rudder, and what I find fascinating is it has twin sail drives. Yeah. And I I've been interested in sort of my perfect boat, and I haven't been shy about telling Bob what that is because mm -hmm. it's based on one of his current boats, <laughs> is a centerboard version of it. Yeah. And, and I'm fascinated by twin drives, especially twin electric drives. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the boat you're showing and because of where the where the sail drives are located, it, it looks like they'd almost have to be electric drives. Is, is, uh, yes, um, yes. I mean, basically, that would be uh, the situation. Um, if uh, if I recall, that boat uh, was published all over Europe, and uh, at the time, uh, she has not been built. Uh, but um, I derived the, the the concept of using. Uh, twin drive basically on another boat on other power boats you know and with the same kind of arrangement and that led me uh, to think about doing it for a sailboat basically so uh, I, I still think uh, it's a good idea obviously the inconvenience is to have two engines instead of one uh, but it's a lot better when you have to back up the boat uh, you know where the the props are in the way of rudders uh, it's more efficient to to do to maneuver. So, is this when you first drew it and thought of it? Is it with conventional, um, you know, diesel engine uh, outdrive? I mean, um, sail drives or no? Uh, it electric? could be it could be both. Really, it depends a little bit on the accommodation aft, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, it can. But I'm, I'm 
I'm not on board the electric thing as much as uh, one could think right now. It's, it's, you need a lot of batteries power and, you know, uh, it's very expensive, expensive to, to get rid of them. Uh, it's, uh, and water, seawater doesn't like, uh, you know, electric in general. So I, I would need to wait probably a little bit longer, but maybe there are solutions that I'm not aware of. Uh, and they, they're making progress. I know that because I follow a little bit, but um, it's, it's something that I don't necessarily advocate for. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing a 50-footer now in Finland and where the guy is actually a specialist into electric motors. And, uh, and so as the boat evolves, I'm sure I will know a lot more what, uh, what the solution is. And one more question, because we've heard other 12 meter stories from the from the 60s and 70s. Yeah. If you could tell a couple of 12 meter design stories from your involvement, yeah. that, that would sort of add to the canon we've already started to amass from some other people. <laughs> and I can only imagine there are some great stories of 12 meter design. Well, uh, for me, it was uh, I just had spent uh, almost a year in England with uh, Ellingworth and Primrose at the time the most preeminent uh, design firm in England, if not the world, with Olin Stevens. But uh, so on my way back, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in France at the time, we had a two year national military service to fulfill. And for me, after three months of uh, boot camp, uh, Baron Vick uh, sort of fetched me. And my brother was uh, with Robin Fugger, who was in charge of all the training. Uh, my brother was second in command at the time. And, um, and therefore I, uh, I was picked up by uh, the Baron and I ended up working for Andre Moric, the, the French architect who actually designed the boat. At the same time, I had some interaction with Britain Chance because the Baron Vic uh, wanted a, a trial horse. And so he hired the uh, Britain Chance to design uh, Chance Eger and a beautiful boat. I mean, really, really uh, not as extreme as what he did later on, but a really interesting boat in order to, to be a trial horse. How, how, old, how old were you at this time, E. Marie? Uh, uh, just 20. Ah, uh, whoa. Just 20, I uh, just turned 20 actually. And um, uh, so uh, I did my uh, boot camp and then I ended up uh, working for Andre Moric and I was sort of uh, the go-between um, three places, uh, not university for the tank testing of some of the models, uh, designing for Andre Morick and working on my own 12 meters in between. <laughs> and, um, but it was, uh, it was a good time. I learned a lot from Andre Morick because he was a mathematician in the first place. And he had, uh, you know, when everything was drawn by hand, splines and all, uh, he found a way to actually ana analyze the flow of the water over the curvature of the hull, you know, by using a derivative of uh, diagonals, as we all know, diagonals are, you know, straight line, basically. We actually, when we designed boats, we, we followed every perpendicular to the next, next stations, which means that we had a tremendous amount of station to work with. And uh, that way we could, we could really, it took, an incredible amount of time. But basically we could analyze the flow, uh, not the speed of the flow per se, but the direction of the flow in general. And that was something that uh, I, I, I don't use that anymore, obviously because, uh, because computers, you know, but uh, it was very, very interesting working for him. I also did uh, another 50 footer uh, cruising boat for him. I mean, I was only perfecting my lines plan designs, you know, I mean, Drawing lines were was uh, something that I really like, and uh, yeah, geometry in space. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, one story about twelve meters. Any more, Stephen? Hello. Yeah. Well, I, I talk about the IOR. I mean, that's uh, yeah. <clears throat> so many people out there have boats that were. <clears throat> designed during the IOR time. And there's a lot of confusion about certain design features and old IOR boats get a bad 
get a bad reputation yeah. when they, yeah. it's not deserved. No, <clears throat> some, no. some of them are fabulous boats, but yeah. you were right in there when yeah. the IOR took off. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of history, I mean, the IOR was started with Olin Stephens, Dick Carter, and Van der Stadt uh, from Holland. And basically, it was uh, trying to amalgamate uh, the difference between the CCA at the time ruling uh, on this side of the Atlantic and the ROC ruling in England. And obviously, I had some uh, some experience uh, with the ROC since uh, I was working, uh, you know, previously with uh, INP, Ellingworth and Primrose. So basically. It was a, a, a mixture of the two that led to the first IOR uh, boats. And, um, and, and therefore, I had, you know, some, even though I had very limited uh, experience with CCA, uh, I could see uh, the, 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 the combination of the two could work. And I was not part of the making of the rule per se, not at all. But uh, I tried to interpret it, it and uh, we came up with some. Uh, uh, Idra, in particular, was was very very successful boat. And uh, do we have a uh, picture of that? Do we get? Um, uh, well, I could find one, but uh, oh, what well, maybe? Uh, when, I, don't, when I don't know how to uh, how to to show it. So, but maybe later on, on uh, when we polish the the YouTube or something, I, we can do uh, more. Yeah, when either came out, boy, that that was my favorite boat. That was yeah, a, she was cool. Spectacular yeah. boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, pre um, Idra was design number twenty one, and that started. My first design there was probably number fourteen. So, uh, all part of fourteen, and you know, and so on, but. Uh, yeah, she was special, even though, I mean, it's amazing where uh, obviously we got tranced the next year with uh, Gambari, even though we won the, the world championship in Sardinia in 1973. I was there, Ron, Ron Holland was there. And um, uh, Gambari was the faster boat. And, uh, but the reality also is the fact that Gambari uh, was a strip plank boat, you know, built in 45 days and... Uh, and uh, with nothing, I mean, really uh, very super light, uh, 2,500 pounds lighter than we were on Idra. Idra uh, was built by Haberking and Rasmussen in Germany and uh, with a quarter inch uh, aluminum shell, yeah. I mean, which would be half these days, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, a lot of things made a difference. And um, Gambari basically uh, stole the show the, the following years and, and uh, Propped up uh, Doug Peterson to uh, to the top, basically. Hello. Yeah. I have a uh, Joseph Kulberg there. I don't know if yeah, he wants to talk Jody. to me. Oh, Jody. Hey. Yeah, I know. I know the the name for sure. Yeah. Uh, good to see you. I've been out moving boats in the front yard and missed the first part. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Eve Marie, you you yeah. did a boat years ago. Mm -hmm. Big day sailor, like 45 foot day sailor with forward swept spreaders. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Did a couple of those, right? Uh, yeah. So yes. I understand how they work. What what made you think of the time <laughs> to sweep them forward rather than sweep them aft? Well, the boat has a story in itself associated to uh, Brad Glazer, who commissioned the boat. Uh, at the time, he, uh, we built a boat in uh, Louisiana, and at the time, he had a house where basically the boat could fit inside the house. And in order to do that, uh, obviously we had to get rid of the, the backstay, but then because the house was, you know, relatively short in relation to the boat, uh, I decided to put the, the spreaders forward so that we had a little more room rather than swept back. So basically the... <laughs> That's the, the that's one reason which is sort of amusing. So the, the the spreader went forward, but there's also another reason for it is the fact that uh, the boat was a day sailor, and actually the commission came about when uh, Brad called me up and said, uh, "I want you to design a, a day sailor about forty six feet or so," and um, um, and you know just to go sailing. Uh, 
with my friends. And I said, Brad, how many, how many friends do you have? Uh, 16. <laughs> oh, okay. So I designed a cockpit for 16 people. You know? <laughs> but again, uh, being uh, single-handed with friends that didn't know anything about sailing than, than I gather, I thought it would be interesting with the swept forward spreaders uh, to have many advantage. So we had a big main and a small jib. And so the big main, when you go downwind without the spinnaker and so on, wouldn't be plastered you know, against the, the spreaders. I mean, the boom was allowed to go a little further forward than normally. And uh, it worked very, very well. And one of the big advantages of the forward spreaders as well is that the shrouds are always under, under tension. You know, it's, it's so one tack to the other, there's no give anything. I mean, they don't go floppy or anything like that. So, so I think it's a, it's a feature that uh, is interesting, you know, for certain aspect of, uh, of designing a sail plan and rigs and so on. Yeah. What, what, what was the downside to it? <laughs> I can't find one. Huh. No, not really. Except uh, that uh, probably because the small jib, if you want to carry, uh, 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 you know, light hair sails, I mean, really light. I had a bowsprit, a thick bowsprit implanted uh, within the pulpit, you know, projecting part of the pulpit and where you could, you could have a, you could have a much larger sail, the reacher, you know, that's what I call. So we used that for a few years until it blew up or something. But did it, did it make tacking a, a, a Genoa a little more difficult? Well, that was a reacher. So basically on the reach, you know, uh, if you were tacking the small jib, that's no problem whatsoever. You never use the two at the same time, per se. Because getting rid of that impaling the main on the yeah. aft swept spreaders, yeah. that's a huge advantage. Yeah, oh, yeah, done win. I mean, <laughs> the boat is really fast. I mean... And I learned that from my cat catches, you know, where there's no, no shrouds. So the, the, the wishbone boom or the, even the boom go uh, readily around the mast, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so that one thing led to another. How many boats did you do with forward swept spreaders? Uh, two, three only, <laughs> three. Why do you think it didn't catch on? Well, a lot of things don't catch up with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is different. <laughs> this is different. Yeah. Well, talk about talk about your work with uh, Ta Chow and the double ender. Oh hmm. yeah, well that was interesting. Um, I had this friend of mine, a uh, uh, dealer, a boat dealer, uh, who was actually working. Maybe the the name you will recall the name uh, Bob. His name was Mike English. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Exactly. How can I ever forget Mike English? <laughs> exactly. Oh, can anybody forget Mike English? <clears throat> but anyway, he came to the office and he said, uh, with this, Gary Hoyt at the time, I'd already started, obviously, what was pretty, pretty famous in the same direction, having no, no, I mean, freestanding rig, basically. And his office was across the street from my office. And we, we saw the success of uh, the Freedom 40 and uh, basically wanted to do the same thing, but obviously I couldn't do the same thing, you know, it had to be different. So I came up with, uh, with the, what's known as the Tanton 43, then uh, the 45, and in between using the same hull with a deeper keel, uh, a cutter version. So, but they were all three boats and the, the hull is still to these days, I think it's, it's really good, really good design. Um, yeah, people like that boat, very popular yeah, boat. Yeah, she, she is. And, uh, but, uh, so basically we end up, uh, they flew me to, um, to uh, Taipei and uh, Ta Chao and um, I've been there half a, well, a dozen times at least over the years until uh, 1992. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'll jump in. Yeah. I'm the, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice. I'm the owner of uh, Jambo, a Tanton 44. Oh, yeah, yeah. I uh, have had it over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Actually, you've got a good bit of our, my family on here. It's been a big part of our life. So mm -hmm. could you give us a little more history on the background of that design? You mean the, the 44 per se? Yeah, well, yeah, yes. On. Yeah, like I said, uh, you know, because the cat catch had one problem, the fact that 
people are not used to uh, this sort of rig, uh, you know, sailing, wishbones, and so on, even though it has been for, for centuries almost, you know, <laughs> very little shroud and, you know, anyway. So basically, uh, when you present a concept like that, it's a, it's a hard sale, you know, it's a hard sale. I always joke that uh, if we want to sell more boats, we had to put fake spreaders, you know, something. Like <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, we would have sold more boats. No, but, but the dealers were sort of impatient and, uh, and, and they wanted me to come with a cutter, you know. So... And I know that the hull was excellent and could be adapted uh, by uh, increasing the draft by one foot. Uh, so we, we added uh, one foot to the draft uh, to, to compensate by, uh, by the, the weight of the masts of the cutter, you know, which uh, doubled basically what, where the two uh, carbon fiber spars were. So basically, they, I think they are, they are good boats. Uh, they, Tachao was, uh, to be honest, a so-so builder they, because the way they are working, if I recall correctly, uh, we built number one and it was, uh, okay. Number two, oh, it's better. Number three, oh, it's wonderful. And then number four is like going back to number one, simply because <laughs> they changed the contractor, you know? And so <laughs> it took us a few years to figure that one out, even though we had inspector and uh, on uh, Stadel, you know, uh, was uh, was on board. Uh, so, so the the forty four uh, we built, I think eighteen of them, and uh, it, it could have been hundreds if it, it was handled properly by a dealership and feud and uh, battles and <laughs> of brokers, you know. But uh, but uh, I'm proud of uh, this product. Uh, uh, We're number ten, and you have oh, yeah. a couple of very nice pictures of us on the blog under Spinnaker. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I remember going going to Mexico. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, num I'm number seventeen, and you've probably seen my journey up from Annapolis to Ipswich. So yeah, oh, yeah, every, yeah, yeah. All of my friends who get on it go. Are we really doing six knots? I go, yeah, we're really doing six knots. There was no win. There's enough win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she's surprising actually. I own a couple over the years. I mean, I couldn't be sentimental and keep them too long because I had to sell them. But um, and I could handle the boat very very much alone. And uh, on my blog, to get back to that, uh, we have I have several uh, chapters on the various version and uh, some of the experience of uh, the owners uh having a good time with the boat and yeah yeah i'm always curious about how the how how the spec for the mass was came up with and also i yeah, have the original yeah. mass which seemed fine to me and i don't know how yeah. to how to inspect them to see if they're <laughs> yeah it's hard to inspect that's for sure it, it came about as we were developing uh, the design, uh, the, the question of mass manufacturing came about. And obviously we couldn't really use the freedom mass because, well, I don't think Gary would have been very happy about that. So we started to investigate. And eventually we found this firm in uh, Wisconsin, McLean Anderson. Uh, it was more of a laboratory than anything else, even though they had the division. Uh, tied up to the U.S. government for defense program, a very sophisticated uh, composite manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So uh, we flew to, uh, to this place in the middle of the wood. I mean, it was incredible. And the first thing I noticed is that people coming in and out, you know, at any time of the day, they were, they were nerds, basically working on computers and all kinds of things. And so, but one of the engineer, you know, uh, took a liking about this project. And for them, it was very easy to do, very simple. So we built a mandrel about 60 feet long and uh, to rotate. And they used a technique where the individual filaments were wounded up around and in all kinds of direction around the, the, this mandrel and eventually uh, cure in epoxy and cured uh, in uh, oil oil bath if you believe that mm -hmm. and uh, we came up with um, you know safety factor of five if I believe, if I remember um, so over the years they changed slightly in the sense that uh, we uh, we had a little more control on the band you know um, what was what was what was the typical pounds per foot of that that spot uh, the, the, the whole spar I think 240 feet 
Uh, pounds, sorry. Yeah. So, so when you say five to one, that means uh, five times the writing moment? Uh, no, safety factor, basically. It, that's what I meant to yeah. say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty so, light. So, that's pretty light. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's unbelievable. That's why uh, with the cutter, you know, the mass were so much heavier that I added, you know, one foot to the draft. Because I, I, for yeah. a rule of thumb, I, I used for the two tonner I did Heather. Yeah, that that was a Stearns rig, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that spar was six pounds per foot. Yeah, uh, uh, and you're you're lighter than that. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. No, there's no no question. I don't think anybody is actually using that manufacturing uh, uh, method. Um, and as uh, the sales went out, they, you know, they, they had better fish to, to go, you know, to, to do in that, in that environment. But one, one little anecdote, as the mandrel moved fore and aft, the office space was relatively small. So in order for the mandrel to, to, to benefit of the lengths, the full lengths of the building, there was a door in the way. So we drill a round door. <laughs> 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 and the engineer behind the door and behind his desk is at his mask coming to his face <laughs> back and forth <laughs> through the hole in his door <laughs> so all the masks for the boats were built that there by that by that manufacturer by that builder uh, no 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 um they, they were you know this is another dealer situation where some of them didn't want to pay the pay the the the, the cost, and so they, but very few. I don't know the numbers because um, because I don't. And, yeah, I'm wondering. Uh, about and some of them were built by Freedom. Some of them were built. I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I don't know, but very few, very few. Yeah, uh, that was a problem with some of those Taiwan projects because the the yards never had a, a cohesive yeah dealer network and the dealers were all at war with each other oh absolutely yeah and uh and guys like you and me we didn't know what was going on we couldn't yeah. keep track mm -hmm. of it yeah you know, they, we had no control dangerous. but um uh yeah i mean they were and also the dealer they wanted to break prices you know it, it was a cost basis i mean to to have more profit which is understandable but at the same time, they cut they cut their own nose many times in some of the boats for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If, if anybody wants to see forward swept spreaders, which <laughs> when I'm looking at them now for the first time, and it's quite disquieting and, and a little upsetting, but I'm getting used to it. Just go to <laughs> sightsailing.com. Yeah, sightsailing.com. Yeah, and you you can enjoy it for yourself if enjoy is the right word. I, it looks so weird, but then I looked at the video of it sailing, and I'm like, wow, that makes total sense. Once you see it going, you're like, okay, yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, no, it works, it works very great. Well. Yeah, it works very well. It's probably of a, of a you know conventional masthead uh, rig, uh, the easiest boat to sail. I mean, it's unbelievable how easy uh, it is. The combination of the large main that you establish. Yes. She is a tour boat, you know. That's how it's sailing. Yep. So in and out seven times. Well, five times a day. Uh, 750 times a year, uh, uh, just under 10,000 people a year, you know. Going no, it's up. so smart watching the video. It's just, you go, wow, that makes total yeah. sense. And, and so you watch the guy, you watch, you know, 20 people on the boat smiling and one guy driving and doing everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's a, it, it, it's a, it is a great concept. I mean, it, it is, uh, and a great boat. Yeah, about me too. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Where are your jib sheets? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, hey Eve, yeah, uh, did you ever get a chance to see or go on board Project Amazon that um, aluminum hull twin wing unstayed masted boat? Oh, you mean, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> let's leave it at that. Uh, that's, not such, that's not something what, I would have done, but anyway. What are your thoughts on all these new fancy boats with the, with the fat wide sterns and the twin rudders and all that kind of stuff? Well, it's, I don't know if it makes a better boat or not. I mean, probably faster boat in certain condition. 
but then uh, you know the the association of what's happening interior wise i mean large cabins and toilets everywhere uh conduct to a, a broader broader stern in which case obviously to achieve balance uh, you have twin rudders you know so it's 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 it there is a logic to it um and um and you know the production boats seems to be all in that direction yeah well you're doing you're doing a big scow like 40 footer now right yeah i'm i'm involved in uh, class 40 actually uh, yeah. being built being built right now uh, but th those are animals totally different you know they 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 are for single handed or two and they, they are, it's a box rule so you have limitation in many directions uh, it's an interesting concept because it's a fast growing class in Europe. Um, uh, they, they're getting very sophisticated. At the same time, they still have a basic uh, laminates. You know, there's no carbon allowed except for the mass and booms and things like that. But uh, uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, obviously, I've followed uh, the class 40 for years and years and years. I, I designed even a, a few of them. Uh, but only on paper until someone, uh, you know, uh, contracted me uh, this year, actually. And uh, uh, so we're building the boat. Is, is, and... that, is that a box inside a box? <laughs> well, yes. I mean. So they, they give yeah. you maximums and minimums. Yeah. No minimums, but maximums. Basically. Oh, that's just a yeah. Scale. Yeah. Yeah. Displacement max, uh, minimum and uh, beam maximum, length maximum. Uh, yeah, sail yeah. area confined to a certain sail area. Um, you know, uh, and on the twin rudders, how much we we tow those in? Uh, I do, um, but it's not necessarily because the boat heals a lot. You know, I mean they 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 have tons of sail area and they're always on the side. So uh, whether a tow in uh, would would really change much? Uh, I don't know. I hmm. don't know. But it can be it can be articulated in a way where you can adjust the to in. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty complicated actually. You can adjust the to in while you're sailing. Uh, you could, even though it may not be uh, easy. Uh, and what would know. be the typical to in angle? You, you, uh, you... I've used on keels. I mean, on on uh, on twin keels, uh, up two degrees maybe one one and a half degrees, two degrees. I mean, it's small, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah so yeah the the, the boats uh, with the fat stern it's for fat ladies you know yeah well, <laughs> there are any on board are there any on this call <laughs> my, my only my only problem with it is that yeah some of these production boats they're mm -hmm. they're moderate displacement and then people and they they try and equate that big fat stern to the mm -hmm. big wide stern on your 40 mm -hmm. but they but they don't correlate they're two totally different boats yeah but there's just no way of getting around that advantage of more volume aft for quarter bursts that's right yeah i just think about hitting something with one of those rudders first time i saw mm -hmm. it, I said, man i hope you don't hit something because you're screwed mm -hmm. you're screwed yeah, you you would screw it with many other rudders as well, you know. But yeah, um, you got one spare. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's true. Backup. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I like skegs. What can I say? Yeah. So I asked if Rob Ball this question, and he answered it. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you too. Okay. Tell us about a disaster you've had. And I don't mean somebody falling yeah. off and drowning. Uh, uh, I, I was sure something like that was going to be propped up uh, because <laughs> I essentially uh, uh, one is why I'm famous or rather infamous is uh, the sinking of Circus Maximus, you know, a 66 footer that I'd built in my yard in uh, on this island here, Branton Yachts at the time. And she was one of the, the earliest uh, ULDB, you know, ultralight displacement boat uh, on the mm -hmm. East Coast. Uh, launched shortly after Merlin, uh, Merlin fa fame of um, in, in on the West Coast, winner winner of the Transpac uh, of that year, or at least uh, elapsed time. 
So uh, designed that boat and uh, we had plenty of success. We, we held the, the record for uh, the, Mac, uh, the Halifax race for like 10 years. Um, you know, and I've seen 27 knots all the time. Uh, and uh, they, they were uh, chartered by a, a group of French to beat the record of the Atlantic. So they left and they were actually 100 miles ahead of the Tabalese record at the time. And uh, it was a horrible night off Newfoundland. And the, the 20 foot seas uh, under full spinnaker, you're going uh, God knows how fast. And the mass fell down because the, the running backs, they let go. And the mass, you know, fell down <laughs> over the side. And the boat was seven layers of mahogany and wood, very light structure, but uh, relatively strong. But after a while, in the middle of the night, they had such a hard time to cut the rig and the mast of the boat. Uh, the, the spreader started to poke against the hull and eventually, uh, you know, yeah, they had a hole. And so they were on the way <laughs> to be halfway across the Atlantic. And so it was time to put, to put on a May Day. And um, so they were picked up by a, a container ship. And I went to see them, I uh, think it was in Baltimore. Yeah. Uh, so that was one disaster. But, you know, I mean, people thought that this boat could be the Atlantic record. So it's, it's that was quite a great, That was a great boat at the time. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. So did, did, did it have any chimes? No, no, it has actually a strangely V turn. Uh, I, I, I took that from Merlin. I mean, we were wider than Merlin, uh, but but uh, for some reason, um, you know, he, on Merlin, he managed to to get really fast downwind speed with a slight V. Yeah, and never... I thought, and I thought because the boat is healing, you know, uh, so it's a flat, you know. <laughs> yeah, but he he used that on uh, Billy. Used that on all. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Carl Schumacher on most of his. Yeah, exactly. So there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. It depends how often you sail downwind versus upwind, and so on. You know. Yeah. So shall we continue on the disasters? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, the second one. My uh, friend uh, John Tuttle, uh, as we were building Circus Maxima, came to the yard. He said, Eve Maria, I want the same boat except 57 instead of 66 feet and uh, ULDB and so on. So I designed this the first Desperado for him, a uh, 57 footer, 20,000 pounds, uh, really, a really good boat, fractional rig, uh, huge mainsail, relatively small jib. Uh, a boat I've seen, uh, we, we had a club on that boat. We had t-shirts saying 20, 25 knots, a club, because that boat was cap capable of 25 knots. I mean, more often than you ever think. So basically um, we had a fair amount of success on the race course, even though IOR eventually penalized 10% 10, 10 on the rating. So that didn't, was not too good. And John decided to go across the Atlantic to beat the record. And they left in December. And again, halfway across this time, uh, they, they, they were hit by, by 76 knot uh, Oregon force. Uh, again, huge seas and everything else. And they, they took a knockdown. Everything was fine until then. And then they took a knockdown, which uh, broke uh, the spreaders on both sides. It was a stern mast, you know, uh, fractional. And they broke uh, the spreaders, and so therefore they couldn't they couldn't control the mast, and they were halfway across the Atlantic. And basically, John said, uh, "We can't we can't go anywhere." And so they waited uh, they waited for the container to pick them up, and the the boat the container was on its way to Baltimore, I believe, or oh, New York, I forgot, but anyway, and um, for two days that container ship was reduced to two knots speed against the waves. I mean, the, the, the captain was on, on deck all the time, sweating bullets. I mean, if anything went wrong, that boat capsized. And that gigantic brand new containers to such an extent that at the arrival, the bow was twisted over two meters on one side. Wow. So, you know, yeah, abandoning the boat was probably the right decision because uh, 
clearly <laughs> what happened, you know, within 24 hours later uh, was would have been a disaster. So basically, there's been a disaster, but at the same way, we didn't lose life, you know, and uh, that, yeah, as you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. But those things, those things do, you, you take those things personally because you're, oh, you're yeah. sort of emotionally attached to your, your work. Oh, yeah. I, I always remember Roger Martin telling me, I said, Hey, Roger, would you do another Aimo Cabo, you know, for the round the world uh, race? He said, well, I'm not too anxious about it because I don't like three o'clock in the morning phone calls, you know, when, <laughs> when something really bad happens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Roger, is, he was a good man. Another younger than us, a uh, designer that passed away in uh, June of this year. Yeah. Well, he a good was, guy too. He was younger than we are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A very good guy. A good friend of mine. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs> How about two beginnings? How about your beginning? Most designers start doodling when they're twelve, uh, thirteen. Yeah, exactly. And then you're beginning at Carter. You're beginning at yeah. Carter. I mean, he had Red Rooster. Uh, Oh, yeah. Tina, you come in on Tina. Uh, uh, you got direction from Carter. What? Uh... Well, to start at the beginning, I mean, I was introduced to sailing about age eight or nine. Uh, my grandmother was from Belgium. And in the summertime, we lived in Morocco at the time. And I was uh, in boarding school in France during the winter. And I spent a few weeks uh, in, uh, in a place called Zeebrugge. And there at age nine, that was my first uh, sailing lesson. We had cadet, you know, a small oh, yeah. uh, pram, pram, pram uh, dinghy with, uh, with a spinnaker and so on. And I, I didn't want it to go there for some reason. I have a tendency to say no about a lot of things. But anyway, eventually I ended up there. A week later, when it was time to leave, they couldn't find me. I was hiding into a, <laughs> into <laughs> a weird places. I mean, my, Annie Van der Wiel, I don't know if that we call a name to you, but she was, uh, she, did, she, she wrote a book called uh, Penelope Around the World or something like that. She was one of the earliest in the 50s uh, going around the world on a cruising boat. But anyway, she was the, the manager of it and they were looking for me all afternoon. <laughs> I was hiding. I didn't want it to leave. But that's where I, 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 I thought that sailing was something very, very interesting. And then age 12, uh, I started doodling, really. Uh, every book, every, every piece of paper at school, you know, that you can find. Exactly. And soon enough, I tried to, to analyze all the various dimensions and make average and median and everything else. And that lasted until I started sailing offshore. In uh, I was 16 or 17 years old, uh, and it just happened. It was very active. I lived at, at the time in the south of France, and uh, that's where I got to know John Ellingworth. And um, we had a friend of the family who had a small boat, a 30 footer called a Faraman, uh, very ULDB for the time. And uh, my, uh, my brother and I, um, we, we used to stick the boat to ourselves in Sardinia or Corsica. And we camp, we, we do for food, <laughs> literally fish mm -hmm. of the stern. It was a really great time. And then I got involved with uh, heavy offshore racing and Aero RC. Um, and uh, jumping a few years, uh, I found myself in Denmark where I met Dick Carter for the first time in 1966. The same year oh. I joined, yeah, I joined, um, I joined uh, Ellingworth and Primo's in England for almost a year. And then after that, I went back to France to do my national service, at which time, I, and like uh, we spoke earlier, uh, to work for Andre Morick and the 12 meters program uh, led by uh, Baron Vick. Yeah. Ellingworth and Primo's, did they do outlaw? Was that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 1963. So that was three years prior. Prior to that. But yeah, I was. It, I was involved in the successor called Oryx. I did uh, two Admiral's Cup uh, uh, competition on that boat, owned by one of my mentors, a um, uh, person named Francis Bouygues, one of the largest contractor in France and all over the world, really, uh, an interesting character. You can read that on my blog under mentors, mentors. 
and uh, it includes basically John Ellingworth, uh, Francis Buig, and the Carter, and uh, you know a few others. <laughs> uh, oh, that when I was a kid, that was my that was my favorite boat for a yeah. while. That's oh an yeah, amazing I mean, boat. Magic. I see her once in a while in South of France. You know, she's still going strong and painted white now, <laughs> uh. but uh, you know, the sun can do <laughs> damage. Um, no great boat and that i was inspired too yeah, and that's why i wanted to work for them you know i well, wanted to work on top <laughs> for, an, for an american kid who was used to seeing mm -hmm. cca boats yeah yeah that, that looked like right. a spaceship you know that, yeah. oh yeah <laughs> we just didn't have anything like that over here no and that's why it was felt because every, uh, what was it, two years, you had the Admiral's, Admiral's Cup and you had boats coming from the US and boats obviously in England, in France and so on. But one were designed for the CCA and then one for the, you know, for the ROC. So that's when really they decided to combine, you know, the two, uh, the two mode, uh, mode of uh, rating uh, to combine into something that became the IOR. Because there well, were too too many differences between the the two concepts. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you you did when when I came to the tower, you had done Mabel and oh, uh, yeah. and frigate. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Were beautiful. Had, Those were beautiful boats. Yeah, yeah. Well, frigate ended up uh, winning uh, the Admiral's Cup that year overall. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful boat. Yeah, but prior one of one. One of good boats. I did. You know, all, I mean, all the lines plan as usual, but maybe a little more than usual at the time because I was the only one in the office with uh, Dick. Uh, it's Benbow, a sixty-five footer aluminum built by Yosman. Beautiful boat. A oh, beautiful boat. A winner of two or three times the Middle Sea race. Still going strong right now. Oh, yeah. uh, for Dottore Recchi, I remember, and um, and uh, she was she was she is a, a beauty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk about the Vendredi Trieste. Well, that's a story in itself. And I've been attributed having designing the boat, but obviously the project started before I showed up there. It was started by uh, Jean-Yves Théalin and uh, Dick and uh, Jim Hardwick Anderson. And, but basically I finished the whole boat. Uh, uh, the Jim had left uh, Denmark in June of that year, 71. And so I, f I did all the final lines, the keel, rudder, sail plan. The sail plan was a three masted with three jibs and uh, it came time to decide what the, was the, the surface. And, as, and I knew we could hardly uh, hoist single-handed the, the main sail of a 12 meter. So basically- Tell, 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 <laughs> tell the group here yeah. length overall of this single-hander. Uh, 100, 128 feet. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, 20 feet wide. And she was, uh, when first launched, she was uh, the lightest piece of fiberglass boats ever built. I mean, it was like, if I recall, 69,000 pounds, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, too unbelievably light. And that was uh, made for which we had very little to do. The construction aspect of it uh, was made by a yard in France. Uh, Tessimar, and they they had pioneer really the infusion system that now is very very current. So basically, uh, you infuse the hull with resin, you know, hull, and uh, to try to go. A, a, a small anecdote is the fact that sometimes you add void and you come with a big syringes and you inject epoxy you know it was it and uh, she was very flexible when first we went sailing so we had a uh, we had to add a big center keel you know vertical center keel reinforcement but the boat was a uh, successful we, we came in second unfortunately and on, right. the, on that race uh, beaten by a trimaran so you know but um still pretty remarkable yeah pretty remarkable only a few hours after I think Club uh, Med bought that boat. Yeah, yeah, Club Med bought, and for years and years, uh, the boat was very successful at chartering in the West Indies. Uh, Tiller steered, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. We had a wheel. Oh. A go, go your wheel, yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, yeah. Yeah. But the keel was steel, uh, and the lead, obviously, inside, and the rudder was steel. Uh, 
but the uh, wheel of steering, yeah. This was the first time I saw someone wearing a mask, a cask rather, rather in, uh, on his head at the start of the transatlantic race, Jean Delay <laughs> on the boat. <laughs> a helmet? A helmet, sorry, yeah, a yeah, cask, yeah, yeah. Helmet. helmet, yeah. And yeah, there, was, there was nothing like that, but prior, no, to, the, prior no. to that, or really since that. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, Jean Yves Terlin had, had, had some prior success in um, a race across the Atlantic and a race uh, towards uh, Tokyo, I believe, in Japan. So he knew exactly what he wanted, uh, and uh, obviously Dick was very enthusiastic about weird projects like that. You know, <laughs> unique. Uh, but uh, you know, I was privileged to be um, to be part of it. That's for sure. I have a question. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> so um, I first met Mark Lindsay in 1971. So he must have been at the Carter Design Office at the time. I remember him mm -hmm. mentioning your name. And the way I met him was yeah. sailing International 505s. Mm -hmm. That's right. It, it, I, you know, I actually did some management consulting for him back in the mid-1990s. Okay. I've always wondered why it was that Mark decided to get into the building business as opposed to pursuing design? Well, I couldn't answer that. Uh, first of all, it came, it came uh, later than 71. He was involved into something else. I know we were, we were a roommate at one time. I mean, a whole bunch of us, Chuck Payne, Art Payne. Uh, and, you know, we, we all lived together basically in, uh, on Kirkland Street off uh, Harvard, and and because later when, on near Boston. When I when I met him, he was living in Swampscott. Yeah, that's right, Swampscott. Yeah, yeah, we lived there too. But uh, but why he uh, went to boat building? I don't think Mark was a designer per se. You know, uh, you, you have to remember everything was drafting in those days. You know, and. Mm. I don't think that was his calling. Uh, and eventually he came to the tower, but he couldn't, you know, it was not in 71. It was much later. Um, and uh, and what made him go to, to building? I don't know. Me, I came to building boats for a while because I got tired of waiting for uh, bids from builder to build. So I decided <laughs> to, to do a little venture. Mm. So that could have been the reason. Uh, by that time, he probably dealt with a lot more sophisticated uh, program, you know, MJ. Mark was always fiddling around with dinghy parts at home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Things. I think he saw himself as more of a builder. Yeah, absolutely. Because he had sort of an unusual drafting style where yeah. some of it was freehand and some of it wasn't freehand. It worked. It was very effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it yeah. wasn't really technical drawing so to speak that's right yeah but he was very much involved in the construction if i recall of the 505 uh some of the stars and i i don't quite know to be honest yeah, but, he was uh, a, he was a true innovator in in uh dinghy building yeah yeah um, built a, mm -hmm. a a fireball that was that won mm -hmm. the world championship yeah, um, yeah did the first carbon fiber uh 505 yeah. um you know, very, very innovative. And then he started doing a series of designs that were done by Jim Taylor, which were yeah. primarily geared to the to IMS. That's right, yeah. And then uh, MGM came, the Johnstone, you know, and uh, the and rest is his story. Got rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was a good person, always laugh, laugh a lot. <laughs> yeah. He, he was, was top and lanky, you know. <laughs> yeah, he was kind of the gentle, the gentle giant. I love the guy. And, and Yeah, yeah. Did good man. Like Block Island Race Week with him and stuff like that. Yeah, we were I a lot of personality. Was, but, mm -hmm. I remember a time in the summer, it was hot, and we all decided at lunchtime we'd go for a swim. Mm -hmm. So we, <laughs> we went swimming down there below the tower, and Mark, later in the day, Mark was up there drawing away at his drawing board, and all he had was a towel wrapped around his waist. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've somehow that story does not surprise me at all. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I've seen something up at the top of the tower, that's for sure. Yeah. Including the black cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's fun. Well, we all add our personalities, you know, and uh, individual, that's for sure. And, 
you know, between Chuck, very different from Bob. Uh, me, uh, probably more different than anybody else. <laughs> and Mark, and uh, yeah. Yeah, good times. It was a good time. It was a lot of fun. It was enjoyable. Yeah. And we were successful. I mean, we were on top of the world, you know, us and Sparkman and Stevens. Yeah. I mean, they, they were the only two at the time. And it didn't last it long, but, uh, but uh, it was uh, a unique chapter, I would say. And all the, the, the young Turks, you know, Ron Holland came, uh, Doug Peterson. And uh, they had one thing in common, which is, would be absolutely impossible to do now. They actually build their own boat to win major events. And now, I mean, you, you couldn't build the boat they built, you know, for the cost of a mainsail or a jib in cave oh, or, no. or carbon. So no young designer would, would be able to do what they did. You know? Yeah. There's no way. So it's a totally different world. Totally different world. And uh, obviously, uh, and Doug was always a very, very smart guy, obviously, but he was also very oriented towards getting the best clients. You know, I mean, <laughs> you almost had to have an interview <laughs> to, <laughs> for him to, to do. And, but the numbers are uh, the proof in the pudding. You know? Yeah. We guys were quite busy, though, right there in the early 70s, though. Quite busy. Yeah. Now the straight run on the bottom of the Carter Thirty Three. Were you guys kind of looking at Gambry the straight run? Was that why that? Um, well, if you're talking about stern, it was sort of distorted with a gulf tee or whatever. But the the mid section was very very flat. Uh, very didn't, flat all the way very, along. Very very flat. Rocker. And and we carried that on the on the succession of a IOR boat after that. Uh, including uh, Gitana for Rothschild, um, uh, Benbo, uh, Idra, uh, the Carter 39, um, the production version of the 37, you know, all, all the way around we ended up, and mostly dictated by the location of uh, points uh, that you had to reach <laughs> or get. Uh, through the IOR program of measurements, you know, so you, you try to minimize the displacement by go, going shallower and maintain, right. so bring the flatness so that you reach the, the side points at the right spot without increasing the, the volume, basically. Now, how many boats did you do with golf tee rudders? Uh, uh, quite a few, actually. Uh, we had the uh, Wayaniwa, we had the uh, um, um, the, 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 the 33 was really the, I mean, we, I don't know how many they build 100 or 100 plus. Were, were you the first guys to do, uh, the golf tee rudder? I don't know. Uh, to be honest, that was before me. Some. Uh, yeah. The, the, the most drastic was on a boat called Izena and, uh, she had a golf tee rudder, but that, that was also a rule thing, you know, but because you had to be uh, inside the 4% buttock, I mean, that doesn't mean much to anybody, but uh, so the golf tee was, was one way to, to achieve the volume aft and still, um, you know, being too much penalized. Eventually, as the boats get lighter, obviously they get flatter and, you know, the shape change aft and and the golf tee was a pain in the ass to remove. <laughs> Must have been hard to build. Hard to build, hard to remove. Yeah. yeah how do you have? How, how do you remove that? Well, I, if I recall, you you basically have a, a bottom point, you know, and uh, where the shaft itself was cut in two and with oh. a sleeve in between and bolted. If I recall. Oh. Yeah. But uh, Olympic. I mean, the the first one was a boat called Blue, built in Sweden. And uh, then eventually the mall for that boat went to Greeks, uh, to Olympic yachts. I don't know if you recall that, Bob, but uh, they built hundreds of Carter's boat over the years. Oh, no, I remember, I remember Olympic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I sailed on that Carter 39 that they built that came out oh, yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which ended up just rotting at the dock. Really? Oh, just sad. The guy that owned it just... 
Yeah, he, yeah. He had plenty of dough, but he just decided he was going to neglect the boat and he just let it sit there. Yeah, yeah. Where is it now, Dick? Do you know? Amazing. Boomer? I mean, the, the most famous, uh, well, a couple of 43, uh, 43. Yeah, the 43 was before the, um, the 39. And uh, uh, Ed Dumoulin, who owned the Carter 39 called Blaze uh, at the New York Yacht Club, told me one time that that Blaze, the Carter 39, was the best boat he ever had. And he had tons of boats and very successful sailor and everything. Another 39, uh, JNB, I mean, they own. They, own, they won a lot of things and Phoenix in the lakes. But unfortunately, yeah, many times, I mean, boats are neglected, you know. Yeah, just, well, uh, that, you know, that sailing that boat had a lot to do with the Valiant 40 because I'm sailing that boat mm -hmm. thinking, why can't this be a cruising boat? Yeah. Doesn't, yeah, yeah. doesn't have any bad tendencies, no bad characteristics? Yeah, yeah. Like Actually, the 39 be. was uh, uh, derived from Hydra directly, except with a higher freeboard, because initially the boat was going to be flu flush deck, and a few of them were actually flush deck built. So higher freeboard, but the lines followed very much the Hydra, uh, Hydra lines. Yeah, no, great looking boat. No tow rail. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> and, and twin rudder, I mean, twin uh, wheels. Twin wheels. Know. All kind of things. Under under deck lines coming back. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Lined yeah, with own winch. Yeah, with those weird stoppers. Yeah. Tubes. <laughs> no, it's interesting to to reminisce because I <laughs> I don't think too much about that. <laughs> it's so long ago. No, but the future is all right, you know. Yeah. I don't know if you if you were a kid today and wanted to be a yacht designer. There's not many opportunities. It's it, literally impossible. Like I, I said earlier, I mean, Doug and Ronald Holland, you know, the stars of the day, I mean, they build their own boat. They were able to afford that, you know. Yeah. No kids can build a competitive boat these days. It's impossible between the carbon fiber and this, that, uh, all the restriction, it, it, it would be impossible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there are a few Europeans that uh, managed to make it, but like the old days, you know, you know, most of the famous designers in the past had a certain fortune to play with, you know, to stay alive. Uh, but now it's uh, literally impossible. Yeah, well, I married a woman with a good job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we were talking me. about that last night, actually. That could help. It was a big help. Get some stability. Yeah, yeah I understand that. Um, oh, well. <laughs> All righty, Marie. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun to, to, to chat with you uh, guys. And, uh, and I, I had a good time. I mean, I really appreciate uh, this intervention. <laughs> good. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. really. Really. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun all right thank you very much thank you oh. well now you right. have a drink i can't have a drink it's only uh, <laughs> 10 30 in the morning here <laughs> well i've well it's always five o'clock somewhere you know yeah no hey, doubt boomer boomer yes where is, is have you seen rabbit lately have I seen rabbit lately? Yeah. No, I haven't. No. The, the first rabbit? Yeah, is, the, the, Carter, is, uh, the Carter 30. No, no. The Carter oh. 39 rabbit oh, 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 oh. came out here. Oh, it was the flush deck one. Beautiful boat. But, mm -hmm. And he, we, did, we won tons of races. And then he just uh, stopped sailing it and never wow. touched it again. Wow. Yeah, it's very, very odd. Yeah, over the years, obviously, uh, we all have that kind of situation where boats were literally abandoned, you know? Yeah. Okay. I've been meaning to get over there, Bob, but uh, this COVID, you know, I've just been uh, cautious, I've been way cautious. But uh, yeah. 
I will have to make some chili and bring it on over. Make some <laughs> good to me. <laughs> Real good to me. I know. <clears throat> so is this session over or what? <laughs> yeah. We just what? Let, you can talk to people as long as they want to talk. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> I'll leave it up and running. I got a, I got an appointment in 20 minutes, but I'll leave the thing up and running if people want to stay on or if you guys want to do what you want to do. How about you, Ed? Um, anybody? <laughs> I have a question. Did, I have another Dick question. Carter come upstairs. How much did Dick Carter come upstairs and give you guys direction? You, you know, he said, well, you know, we got Red Brewster <laughs> here. We got Tina here. This is the way we want to go. How much did, how much did he come up? Well, you know, I, I never seen him holding a pen in my entire uh, stay there. And that doesn't mean he had not incredible influence. He was out I getting mean, clients for you guys. And then yeah, exactly. Guys. Exactly. And I the same thing happened to Olin Stephens because Olin Stephens stopped drawing, literally drawing boats in 1932. So right. that's a long, long time because he had to deal with an organization, people, you know, clients, and it gets to be very difficult. But, but Dick, when he was there, uh, not jet setting all over the place, uh, he had very much hands on as far as the directions, what he wanted to see, um, you know, and the influence of the client sometimes for sure. Okay, I'll tell you a story about this. Eve Marie was d drawing, a, doing the lines of a hull, and, and Eve Marie would not put the transom on till everything else was done, which is typical, but uh, that's where I learned to do it like that. But, so we had drawn the lines, and they all finished with no transom. And then he called Dick down. And for about 20 minutes, the two of them sat there with a triangle, trying all these different transom angles and locations. And I'm, th I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell's going on here? It's a damn transom. Just draw it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Dick, Dick, they finally arrived at a decision, and Dick left. And I said to Eve Marie, well, why did you ask Dick to help you with the transom? And Eve Marie said, well, makes him think he has something to do with it. <laughs> some, <laughs> some comment like that. Because <laughs> I never saw him draw. He, no. And he, there were times when we'd have to finish the drawings up on a Friday afternoon when he was he was flying out that night. Right. And in most mm -hmm. cases, he hadn't even seen, he was flying off to meet a client and he hadn't even seen the drawings. Yeah. Yeah. He had a lot of clients in Europe. So, uh, yeah. He's probably but, gone quite a bit. But there, there's one thing where we were very for fortunate at the time is that. The builders where we were building the boats knew what they were doing in terms of construction. So we spent literally very little time on that aspect of building. You know, we designed the hull, the this, the that, everything else. Uh, but uh, dealing with uh, Abbe King Rasmussen, you know, Eichmann, um, uh, Carlini, uh, San Germani, all these guys, you know, they <laughs> they build boats, you know, forever. I mean, and they right. they really adapt, uh, and that was very fortunate because we couldn't have, we didn't have the know-how really to deal with so many different materials, for such little time too. Uh, so it, it was an interesting period. That now it it's so complicated the building of a boat. Um, because the different man weight you manufacture, the different rules, the different specialty. I mean, most of the even famous designer, they, they don't deal with that. They have a engineering firm, you know, specialized in, in, uh, in composite, composite and, and material and so on. So it's very diversified. Um, you guys had to provide construction drawings, scantlings. The whole nine yards, then you left it to the builder well, to, to finish it. Well, project. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I remember that my first job ever was to do the scantling rules on the Carter 40, which was a one-tonner. And I had to use Lloyd's, Lloyd's rule. Right. You now, which is not really the most, you know, efficient way of doing it. That was what we knew at the time. Um, but, but that was rare. I mean, 
what yeah. Marie's saying, Dick, is yeah. we didn't tell them how to build a boat. That's right. You're not going to tell Abe King and Rasmussen. the lines and let them do it. Yep. Yeah. You do, you're not going to tell Abe King and Rasmussen how to build a boat. That's, that's right. Not, that's just not going to yeah. work. Right. Especially oh, with okay. aluminum. I remember doing a construction drawing for an aluminum boat. Mm -hmm. I had to take the Abe King and Rasmussen construction drawings and translate mm -hmm. everything from German yeah. <laughs> to English. Oh. I had this little German English dictionary. Yeah, yeah. We, we all terminology. <laughs> yeah, we were all dictionaries. <laughs> <laughs> so it was mainly just, just design the lines, get the lines down and yeah. Them, uh, you know what we call the boat. I mean all deck keel rudder mast uh, sail plan, you know. Deck um, plan, interior plan, deck plan, plan interior plan, plan all that. But, but most of the and I know I still have a study plan of weight uh, done by Bob, and I still keep it because it's so thorough. On one uh, on one wooden boat we did in England somewhere, and it, it, it's marvelous. But the patience to put all that together, and it, it's really amazing, really amazing. I think you've written about that, or you talked about that before somewhere, about that uh, Bob study plans on that. Uh. If I talk, no, it's simply someone, something that if I, I, I've done, basically, I have uh, copies of, of, of his work. And therefore, if I have a wooden boat to do in that size ranch, you know, for basic weight situation, I mean, it's it, you have I to go. In, you brought it up one time in SA over on Salem and Anarchy. Uh, I did. Uh, maybe. I don't think so, yeah. but I don't remember. I'm, I'm on there occasionally, yeah. Yeah, I did. I oh, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of admiration for Bob. Uh, Dick, yeah. Dick has an encyclopedic knowledge of mm -hmm. the world of yacht design. He's, uh, <laughs> we've we've taken some road trips together, and boy, there's not much. Well, he has good taste then. <laughs> uh, he, he doesn't know about it for a guy that has. Never... Like you guys, I started doodling when I was twelve yeah. years old, and. Yeah, and you are very good at it. I mean, your renderings are unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was my passion, just like you. Uh -huh. uh, that matters. But it didn't work out for me. I went to work in the shipyards and uh, Todd, and then later at Lockheed doing the, uh, oh, wow. the Whidbey mm -hmm. Island class LSDs. I did the FFGs at Todd Shipyard, but there was no money in it. And then uh, Reagan stopped subsidizing U.S. shipyards. So uh, mm -hmm. I was basically losing money to stay there. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we can't all become uh, famous yacht designers. So, no, we are a rare breed. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's dwindling. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Especially in America. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know anybody practicing really. If you could talk to any of the dead designers today, yeah, who would you talk to? I would have to go to uh, to my mentors, really. Ellingworth, you know, John Ellingworth was very instrumental to uh, take uh, me under his hood, and obviously Andre Moric, you know, also the French guy. I mean, a genius in his own way. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I would engage in French <laughs> a conversation. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd like to talk to Britain Chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an interesting, but you wouldn't get too, more, too many words out of him. Oh, no. Uh, oh, man. Oh, he, was not, uh, he was not very friendly. No, no. Uh, he, he was actually a very nice person, but he, he was not um, uh, an introvert, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was involved in 5.5 meters uh, that to design for uh, some French friend at the time. Well, that class is and doing pretty well. Yeah. Still? They, they, they were, yeah, the 5.5 are some of my favorite boats, really, to be honest yeah. with you. They're beautiful. Or um, very interesting class. Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah britain chance well you know he was said he was said to be a genius so i said hmm, i really would like to work for him <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah well he he but, certainly uh, did it he certainly did it his own way absolutely yeah yeah you have yeah. to respect that yeah absolutely yeah
and can be serious pitfalls, that's for sure. Yeah. And what about you, Bob, if you had to, to speak to someone uh, of the past? Well, that would be Britain Chance, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, or or the, other, the other guy that's always intrigued me was is Bill Tripp. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, from the time I was a kid, I just yeah. loved yeah, his sure. boats. Remember, oh, those, remember those LeCompte boats he did? Yes, and Touche. You remember oh, that? Oh, oh ex Touche. Oh, oh God, my goodness. Fabulous what a boat. boat. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, got that boat eventually to put it on a rock, but uh, on a rock. But uh, that was an incredible boat. And yeah. uh, Bermuda 40, obviously, that's, uh, that's pure American, you know. So, ex Touche? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Touche, okay. yeah. Touche, um, was that the one that went on the rock in St. John, Virgin Islands? I'm not sure where, but I know it was south somewhere, but uh, I, I don't quite remember. Uh, it was quite a few years ago, obviously. Yeah, uh, a guy named Neil bought that boat. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Something. And it went on the rocks in our anchorage, and oh. next, next day I was snorkeling the wreck. Wow. Uh, and it had this bizarre... Uh, some kind of weird daggerboard, centerboard trunk. Yeah. And I think it had a helm like yeah. an airplane that you could throw the helm. Yeah, it went from one side to yeah, the other side, side to side. Yeah, yeah. the first so, time I saw that, yeah. So I went over, because I always heard about that and read about it, and there the boat is just getting ground away on this oh, rock. And too bad. I snorkeled over from my boat, and I'm in there just amazed, just checking out the construction while yeah. it lasted. Yeah. And all of a sudden, here comes the owner, and he pops up over the gunnel. And I thought he was gonna, I thought he was gonna stab me on the spot. He thought I was salvaging stuff off of his boat. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, everything was bronze on that boat. I mean, the pedestal and the, the, the obviously the centerboard. <laughs> it was like because yeah, we, the the we, CCA uh, counted uh, at the limit on the ballast ratio. Yeah, we tried to, we did, we, and, yeah. we made up, and uh, we did try to salvage the bronze yeah, board yeah. out of that boat, yeah. just to have something, it, the boat just crumbled, and it was, it was one of the most yeah, heartbreaking yeah. scenes so ever. You, you try to cram in as much heavy metal details as possible, because it didn't count towards ballast? That's correct. So, yeah. they had the, I, for, I forget the, the percentage of ballast uh, ratio, but... Uh, so basically, it was very in interesting to, to put very heavy floors, very heavy uh, keel. I mean, not keel per se, but uh, boards and bronze. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, everything bronze, basically. So that was one, one of the ways to, to go around the rule. As usual, <laughs> they are... And that, was, that was an Abe King and Rasmussen boat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wooden, yeah. wooden planking? Yeah, yeah, wood planking, yeah. Yeah, he did fabulous boats. He had a, he had a great eye. Yeah, and one of my all-time favorite is Andine, Andine, oh, 1963. Uh, oh yeah, I love that boat. I mean, yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, I had, uh, when I came to America, I had a few, uh, you know, magazines and things uh, that I kept with me, and Andine was in there in my yeah. folder, you know. <laughs> You're well, talking about good. you're talking about the fifty-seven foot trip. Yeah, the fifty-seven trip. Uh, not, US, not the seventy-three. No, no, no. I mean, there was that was, there a was, trip, no, there was nothing as sexy as that. It was the sexiest boat in the world when it was new. Yeah, yeah. The first that that on Dean the fifty-seven. Yeah, the, the yeah. first one. Yeah. yeah the, you know that's the storm that put uh, Touche on the rocks in Great Cruise Bay, uh -huh. but a Lecompte. 35 on the on the rocks in Chocolate Hole. And I think the only uh, Golandrina, the uh, Abbey King Rasmussen, what were the Concordias? At the time, it was the only Concordia to ever get wrecked. And we managed to get the Concordia off and over to Tortola and patched up because the owner said, there's never been a Concordia lost. And I sure as hell don't want to be the first guy <laughs> to get blamed for losing the Concordia. And, no, no, and they no. did a great job putting it back together. But yeah, it was that was a tough storm and took out three really classic boats. Yeah. 
Well, Ray Hunt was also a, an amazing designer. Yeah. I mean, that that's uh, that that remarkable. Um, I have his book, and uh, I enjoy it very much. Yeah, a book written uh, about him. And, yeah, I don't have that book. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and there's also uh, Ted Hood, obviously. You know, was an amazing. Uh, innovator in so many ways. He was a big heavy hitter for sure. Yeah. So innovative in so many different ways. Just, just a good many designers that have passed away for sure. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't, do I admire anybody now? Uh, probably not. <laughs> 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 well, I know what you mean mm -hmm. because you you rise to a level. Just because we get older, you rise to a certain yeah. level in your career where the guys you admired were, so they're gone, and then you move into their place. And I, I tell you, who I admire who's doing really well is Mark yeah. Mills. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he used to work for you, yeah. right? Well he, yeah. well, he was an intern. Yeah, an I intern. I don't think he ever drew anything while he was an intern, but he had that English accent. I used to let him answer the phone and talk to the clients because he, <laughs> he was really good on the phone. <laughs> but he, he's done That's really a, well. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Very, um, very successful. I, I'm not sure I like his latest project or that... Uh, Foiling, foiling thing. Day sailor, yeah, I that's him, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, the minute you have to wear a helmet to go sailing, and for me, that's the end of it, you know. <laughs> hey, I need I a mean, helmet. Yeah, I need a helmet in my office these days. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, we all slave of Bill Gates, you know, so we yeah. all wearing some sort of device. <laughs> Yeah, that's killing me actually, this computer stuff. I mean, I'm surrounded with computers and frankly, it's wearing thin. And well, the guy that helps me with mine, this Indian guy, Raghu, he yeah. was here the other day and he was saying, Boy, how did you learn all this stuff, Bob? Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. said, Survival. Yeah. It was, yeah. A, if, if you don't learn it, you don't eat. That's right. And I just, yeah. I just picked it up, you know, but yeah. out of pure necessity. Yeah, and also with computers, I mean, obviously, I still have uh, older computers because some of the program I'm using are so old, they're still on cassette or, or disc or, yeah. <laughs> you know, not on USB. So, I mean, I, I have to keep them around so that uh, for programs that I'm very familiar with and I like, uh, I have to go back to once in a while. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, I have at least two computers totally dedicated to very, very old programs. Yeah, I've got I've got one, and I have, I have to keep a, a one screen dedicated to it because if if it runs those programs, it will alter yeah. the aspect ratio of the image. Oh, if I put, if I put it on a big screen. Yeah. Well, I have one one computer dedicated to simply to what I'm drawing. Uh, in other words, no internet access, no nothing. Yeah, I do the same thing. It, it would be such a disaster. I mean, really, <laughs> what a disaster to lose uh, any of the files. Um, so I keep that, uh, I try to save, you know, as much as I can all the time. Yeah, no, I, I, I have one computer that's, that I do my work on that's not connected mm -hmm. to the internet. Yeah, 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 and... Uh, but people but they, say, don't, don't you miss hand drafting? And I say, no. <laughs> the, the last one I did was in year 2000 for a 114 foot schooner. Uh, wow. And that's because my computer went kaput. <laughs> so, so I had to, had to uh, get my ducks in order and, uh, and my spline and uh, do it. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I did only a line plan, no big deal. But um, so they could they could uh, retrieve that on a, a PDF later on, or something. Well, my my eyes aren't what they were when when I was yeah. twenty six years old. 
Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> even with glasses. So mm -hmm. drawing lines to the tolerance that you yeah, taught me. Yeah, it's hard and the precision, I mean, because yeah. I mean it had to be precise, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it was still left to the loftman to to do it properly and not take shortcuts, you know. So you you had to be really uh, precise and um, and I, I pay a lot of attention to that. Yeah, I know. I Remember, I used to take your lines drawing, mm -hmm. and I would draw out the stern at three inches to the foot scale. Yeah, <laughs> through those at through those after oh, stations. Oh yeah, absolutely. The the rudder area. And, yeah. Uh, the buttocks. Yeah. Oh sure. Yeah. As close as I got to drawing lines when I was at the tower. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Here, Bob, draw the butt. <laughs> <laughs> and the butt it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, oh, wow. I'm gonna go, Marie. Thank you. Yeah. Much. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you. I really appreciate. Thank it. you. Uh, thank you too. very and much. Enjoy, enjoy uh, my blog. <laughs> well, the blog is great. Everybody should look at your blog. Yeah. I, I'm just. It's so just fun and educational. Because like I said, you look at all these things that you would that are so far outside of the realm of oh, what, wow. like, um, what is it? Uh, magic, black magic. You, yeah. It's like huge airplane wings on, you know, yeah, freestanding yeah. on this beautiful boat. And you go, <laughs> wow, that's pretty inventive. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Uh, Tent on your design dot blogspot dot com. <laughs> okay. All but right. it's a it's a continual project, you know. I, most of the, the the parts, it's where I leave it with, um, you know, to be continued, and it never is. <laughs> and if if you if you do get a fan club up and running, yeah, let me know because we can promote it on my fan club page. All right, I'll, I'll be working on that. Yeah, yeah. and so I guess I'm the only one that doesn't uh, draw. Uh, I, mean, I was in drawing. But the written a book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, and I enjoy your book and uh, and Chuck's as well. You know, it's really yeah. uh, very different, beautiful. but beautiful. I mean, really. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. All righty, okay. man. See you later. Okay, young man. See okay. you later. <laughs> bye, bye. Bye bye. Yeah.